Thank you once again to our live musicians, Jan and Florian. <laughs> Thank you. So for the next talk, I don't know what else to tell you about Sebastian. I guess you already know quite a but, uh, much and he was already on stage today. I think most of the audience know him very well. Um, and I'm a long time friend of Sebastian. But even I learned something new last night. Uh, we shared a sleeping room together and something new happened. Sebastian started snoring. <laughs> there is something new to discover about longtime core team members every time we meet. So give a warm welcome to Sebastian for his talk about NEOS 9. So, hi everybody. So, actually, sleeping is a really hot topic for me right now, as you might know or not know. Um, so, I have been father of one boy already, who is five right now, and I've recently become father of another boy, who is three months right now. So, actually, um, yeah, <laughs> that is why, for instance, last, last night I, or, and the night before, I, I um, woke up at one o'clock or something, because that's our usual feeding time at night. Um, and um, the night before, it was pretty hard to get to sleep again because, you know, when you have to think about so many things, it's somehow hard to... But last night, I was so tired and I, I slept pretty quickly again. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a bit about migrating a project um, to NEOS 9. And um, I guess most of you have upgraded a NEOS project at some point in time, right? Can, you, can I give a hand who's done that? Yeah. So usually it involves... Uh, reading the upgrade notes, um, um, it involves composer updates, and then you run your database migrations, and then you're more or less set. Then there are some, some notes where you might probably search your source code to some extent, and um, right. And upgrading NEOS 9 is a bit more difficult because that is what I've already explained in the morning, um, because we changed so much in the core system and the core data storage of the system. So I I'll, I'll walk you through that process in like five steps right now. And actually, I'm trying that on a live website, which is docs.neos.io. Um, the production version is still running on the uh, 8.2, I think, right now. But uh, like my version on my laptop is actually running on 9.0 already, so um, based on this upgrade steps. And you can just try and follow along if you like. The, the, the repository is open source um, in, in the Neos project. And um, you can just try that step by step to, to, to follow along. So five steps it is. So let's just, just jump right in. First, what do you need to do? Um, you need to upgrade to NEOS 8.2 or 8.3 and to PHP 8.1 or 8.2, because that's the minimum required level needed. And it's really recommended to, to get to this point, because it's just, um, it, it gives us a stable definition, a stable base. And um, so what you need to do is you need to raise your requirements. So, so you upgrade your, your PHP requirements and your NEOS and NEOS UI requirements. By the way, what I usually do is I also set config platform. Who knows config platform? A few, maybe half, OK. So config platform is a way to say to Composer, just assume that PHP is installed in version 8.1 and assume that Vips is installed in a certain version, for instance. And this makes, PH, uh, makes Composer run a lot more deterministically, especially when running with uh, containers, where the version of PHP inside your Docker container might be different from the version of PHP running on your host. And this is actually really helpful to just make sure it runs uh, really smoothly. I personally like 8.2, so I just upgraded to 8.2 instead of PHP 8.1, but that's pretty much it. Um, PHP 8.2 already works quite well with Neos and Flow. Um, there's one workaround you just need to apply right now. You basically need to uh, remove deprecation, deprecated and strict warnings right now in the PHP in the INI. We will fix that along the way, and this also ties into what Robert told in the keynote, that we will make, uh, or we want to make Flow ready for PHP 8.2 in a really, really good way. But this is like the workaround you still need to do right now. Right, then you test the upgrade just as usual. You just browse your website, you open your backend, you just click around a bit, and that's what you basically do. OK, step one of five done. Let's go to step two. You need to require NEOS 9.0, the development st stuff. And 
we right now did not set up the, the single package subsplits yet. That's something we will probably do in the upcoming weeks. But right now, you need to, uh, imp you need to fetch the NEOS development collection in the 9x dev version right now. We will release regular beta versions also in the upcoming weeks. But uh, that is something. So then you can also rely on the beta versions. But until then, you basically follow along our development branch. And um, uh, NEOS 9.0 works with, P uh, with Flow 8.3. Um, but actually, I think, if I'm right, we already, did we already branch 9.0 of Flow? I'm not sure. I think so. Somebody said this to me, at least. So it might be that, actually, you could leave this note out. Leave this out. And um, then there are two packages in there which, we, which don't have stable releases yet, which means you need to um, explicitly require them, which is the event store and the doctrine adapter for the event store. Um, this will go away as, long as, as soon as we have a stable release for this version. Right. So then, then you run Composer Upgrade. And what happens? Yeah, Composer greets us with a really, really nice error message. Um, you've probably ran across this message already, right? At some point? Some people nodding? Yeah. So what this means is Composer tries to figure out what is an installable set of all dependencies in your system. And if you look really closely, it tells you that uh, the version of this NEOS terminal, um, it says, you know, NEOS terminal uh, requires NEOS UI 7 or 8, and then it found some and some versions, but we said we wanted to have NEOS UI 9.0, so that is something which doesn't work. And if you go other to the second problem, it's the same thing. It says the Flowpack Media UI is missing NEOS 9 compatibility. You see it's saying it requires NEOS UI 527080 or Dev Master, but 9 something is, li is missing from this list. So that's right. This is a problem right now. When you have the situation, you have basically three options. Option one, first check if the package already has a NEOS 9 compatible version on GitHub. So you just browse GitHub, check the composer JSON, and see if there's some compatibility with NEOS 9. That is the easiest way. If this is possible, pick this version. Second, if this is not possible, you can either remove the package and just remember on your to-do list that you still need to take care of this, or you fork the package, raise the version, and do a pull request. And we will see um, both of these variants uh, just in a bit. Right now, I, I determined that these two packages are not so really, really required for running the website, so I just removed them for now. So I'm removing these packages um, in the Composer JSON, and then I rerun Composer Update, I get another error message, and basically we do this same process repeated and repeated. So here we have Flowpack Neos Matomo, where I also said, well, okay, would be nice to get it running again, but we don't need it right now. Just drop it for now, remember it on the to-do list, and continue. And then we had a version where it says, well, carbon include assets requires Neos Fusion something. Hmm, and that's a bit a problem because we need some kind of assets. We need CSS or JavaScript, otherwise our website would look totally broken. So we need uh, this package in, a, in an updated version. So that means what we would like to do is we will fork this package, raise the version, and do a pull request. Who has done this before? Few, okay, that's cool. I'll just walk you quickly through that, what is, what's, what's happening here. So you press this fork button in, in GitHub. Just say, yeah, that's all fine. You wait some seconds until GitHub does its stuff. Then I usually edit the composer JSON directly on GitHub for these kind of things. So I just put in, yeah, yeah, 9.0 is fine for, uh, for, for testing. And if there's something looking like similar to the Neos core like Fusion AFX, I just try this out as well. I commit something. I need to pick my right email address. I don't know why the other one is still listed. Yeah, some message. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Go ahead. Actually, oh, I think, does it continue? Ah, I think the video has stopped. So that's basically what you need to do. And then um, what you need to do in the, your composer JSON is two things. By the way, this me must be the root composer JSON, so the composer JSON of your whole distribution, so in the root of your project. Um, what we need to add is two things. First, we need to reference the forked repository. This is what we do in the repositories block uh, at the bottom, where we say, yeah, we need 
uh, um, uh, uh, my fork of carbon in crude assets. And the second thing is, is we before had uh, version 5.5 installed of carbon in crude assets, and I just directly want a drop-in replacement for this version. So I don't want to mess with any dev dependencies or version upgrades or anything like that for now. I just want a, a direct drop-in replacement. And this is what I can do with this dev master as 5.5.0 uh, notation. I'm basically telling Composer, saying, OK, this would be dev master, or it should behave as version 5.5, but actually it is version master. And after we've done that, actually, yeah, Composer runs through. Composer update installs a lot of things. It updates a lot of things. It removes quite some things. That's pretty cool. Yes. Step two done. So let's try if we actually have a running installation. Step three. Let's just try with flow help. Huh. Didn't work out. <laughs> what a pity. So. Um, if we look closely, it says a certain class couldn't be loaded uh, for some reason. And if we try to find this class, we will see that this class doesn't even exist anymore. So this loads, tries to load a base class of an existing class, and this base class is just gone. So what should you do about that? Um, so there's a tooling which is called Rector, PHP Rector. Does somebody know that already? Yeah, a few? Yeah. So Rector is a really cool thing. It allows you to, to it parses your PHP code, and it allows us to write transformations which understand the PHP code and change some things. So we can introduce variables, we can rewrite some parts of the code, and it emits new PHP code. So this is what we can use to, to, um, to upgrade. And we have created a lot of, lot of rules in this Neos Rector package for upgrading. And we even extended Rector to also work with Fusion files and YAML files, so it really runs with all the stuff we have in our system. So let's just try that. So if you go to Neos Rector, you see some installation instructions. So we have to require the package, and we have to copy some configuration. We'll see that in a bit. So we'll just um, do that. So let's require that. Composer thinks a bit, but it's pretty quick. And then we copy the configuration, and this is what is in there. It basically says, um, um, we want to run the content repository nine migrations and which package we want to migrate. And then we call bin rector, and that's pretty much it. Let's run flow help again. Yes, another error message. So we are doing error-driven development here, by the way. So, but the thing is, what changed is that actually we are getting an error message of a different package right now, right? So because we only changed anything in the distribution packages, so just the site, basically. But here we get an error from Johnito Predi Embed Helper. So sorry, sorry, John, for picking your packages here. <laughs> They're very widely used, so um, yeah. <laughs> So what we need to do is we need to adjust our, our uh, migration configuration by just adding these other folders here. So adding Johnito, Pretty Embed Helper, Carbon Include Assets, and Carbon Link. I just did this step by step. So um, when I fixed the one error, I got the next one. And this is what I basically did. So I, this is the real configuration I've been running with. And when I did all that, then actually Flow Help ran through and just output the normal thing as you used to. And that's pretty cool. I think this is really amazing that it just changes your, your stuff. It looks a bit magic right now, but actually we'll see what it does in a bit. OK, so the code runs. Check. What do we need to do now? Um, fourth, fourth step, we need to set up the content repository. So for the normal database parts in the system, we have doctrine migrations, right? I think you're used to that. Um, it's basically allowing us to change database tables in a controlled way. The content repository cannot use doctrine migrations because we have multiple instances of the content repository available, potentially. And doctrine migrations, they won't work if we have like, well, you could have these uh, three instances or these five instances. And basically, every instance of the content repository has its own set of database tables, and they are prefixed with, some, with the name of the instance. So um, Flow CR setup creates the database tables for the content repository. And that's all it does. It will change also if you already have a, a, um, a content repository set up, then it will also change the, um, the database tables to a new structure. So it does the migration things for everything related to the content repository. 
Right. And then the last but not least step, we need to import our legacy data. So basically reading our node data table and creating events out of that. And then we can work with the events just in the normal way. And this is what is, what is happening. And there's a command for that. It's called flow CR migrate legacy data. Actually, this command name has changed really, really recently. Um, so um, yeah, we, we, we tried to polish it a bit. So let's run that. What is happening there? So we run this command. It asks us if we want to migrate resources and nodes from the current database. And it's, it asks which site it does. And then we get some red error messages. The two error messages we got right now is um, it didn't find some assets because I didn't import the assets in my installation. So basically, images are missing, but that is just because I didn't download them from the live site. And the messages below is saying that the old content repository has some orphaned nodes. And I didn't dare to run uh, node repair on the old instance anymore. So uh, this is why this still exists. So that means it just hints us that some nodes are missing, but actually that's the it, it's, uh, it's nodes which are disconnected from the parent. So that means they were not reachable anyways in the old uh, ecosystem. So nobody could have seen them because you know nodes without a parent cannot be accessed in the old content repository either way. So. And then it says replaying projections. And this about, uh, takes approximately two minutes right now for uh, 4,500 events. So by the way, um, you, what, you just, what you have just seen um, up to the point, so that means uh, our doc site has about 4,500 uh, um, um, nodes in the system. And it's creating one event per node and just creates them one after the other. So just so, so that's, and, and you see it's really, it was really, really quick. And we've also tested that with bigger sites with a few, uh, few I think, 10 or 100,000 events as well. And the slowest part is replaying the projection. So what this has now done is it has, it has filled the events table. So the core part of the event um, storage, of the core part of event sourcing. And what we can then do is we can take the first event and apply it in the projection. We can take the second event and apply it in the projection, and so on. So we basically, it's, it's like if we would do all the changes really, really quickly on our, uh, in, in the back end. So that's basically what's going on. And then it will update our, uh, our database structure one by one um, immediately. And this takes about two minutes for this 4,500 events right now. We can probably speed it up some more, but that's the way it is right now. And there's no progress bar yet. Oops. And sometimes it's done. Let's just try. Um, yeah. And then at some point, it's done. There's no progress bar yet, but we will have one in a bit, I guess. Yeah, and actually, I cheated. It's not five steps, it's six. I, I miscounted when I put the first slide in. Uh, don't do last minute changes to your presentations. It's really a bad idea. Um, so what you need to do is you need to run that, and you need to test that. So you just do flow server run, and yeah, we have a website. And this is actually a NEOS 9.0 version running uh, on my local machine with the live content of Docs Neos IO. So you see some page is looking fine. We can see some other page with more content. The menu is rendering. Um, the backend is actually loading. We can adjust content just as usual. Um, and yeah, let's just see. Um, and the only thing, ideally, if everything went well, the only difference you will notice is one little detail. And this is in the URL. So beforehand, um, we had there the node path in. So we had like the, the hierarchical structure of the nodes in the system. Right now, it looks a bit encrypted somehow. It's, it doesn't matter what this is. It's basically a base 64 uh, encoded address of this is uh, in, in the live work uh, for the user admin workspace in a certain dimension. So in, I don't know, what are we, in English right now. And then we have a node ID. This is what this format is in there. But this is basically, I believe, everything works well. This is the only change you will notice. That's well, that's what it should be. <laughs> Exciting. <Ooh. laughs> so, yeah, I think actually it is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, of course, you know, I, I cheated a bit because <laughs> when I started with the presentation, some small details didn't work out as, as expected. And what I did then, I procrastinated creating the slides. So I actually fixed some rector migrations later on and created some new ones so that it all runs smoothly. So it might be that in your particular installation, it might be that you run into some issues which we didn't encounter here yet. So 
as said, this is not yet perfect. So if you encounter some kind of error which you cannot fix, or if you need to change your code manually in some way, then please let us know in the Slack. It's probably the best address, project CR rewrite, but you can also just create an issue in the NEOS development collection or in the NEOS Rector project, and that's what we will see. So please report it in case it doesn't run through so that we can inc increase this automatic migration coverage. But just to give you an idea, Rector is right now already replacing about, I think, 50 API calls uh, in all kinds of places from the, from the NEOS 8 world to the NEOS 9 world. And I would just give you some ideas what's what's going on on the back, if you like. I mean, we could we could either finish the talk because you know we are done with with migrating, so it's done. But probably it makes sense to look a bit under the hood. I would suggest. So let's see what has happened. So what has this rector magic thing actually done? And to understand that, um, we just need to recap a few terms in terms of uh, uh, a, a few definitions, basically. And so what you see here is a, a, a typical node tree in English and in German, and you see there's some connection between the English and the German version um, of a certain page, and this is possible. That's just a, a few pages you have in your system. And NEOS 8 somehow, or the old NEOS versions always said, well, this is a node and a workspace and a dimension and somehow, but these, def these words were not really very specifically well, defined, I would say. In NEOS 9, we have very, very specific terms for all these concepts, and I'll just walk you through them. It's not as hard as it, as you might, as it sounds. So a node is the most central concept, just as you're used to it. A node is uh, some piece of information in this tree in a certain workspace in a certain dimension. So basically, this thing is a node, this guide is a node, Buch is a node, and all the other ones. That's the first concept you need to know. The second one is a node in all its dimensions, so introduction and Einführung, this whole thing, this is called a node aggregate because it puts together a node in all its dimensions. And this whole thing is what we call a content graph. So every content repository has a single content graph, and this is the set of all the nodes and all the node aggregates in all dimensions in the system. And when there is a graph, there is also a subgraph, um, and basically the subgraph is the um, is a view of the uh, is basically the node tree in a certain language and in a certain um, in a certain uh, workspace. So basically, it's saying, okay, this is in in the live workspace in English. Then this part is the content subgraph for it. Um, yeah. That's the first thing you need to know. The content subgraph and the node are the main things you will work on as a, as a normal basis. So if you traverse nodes, then this is what you work on. Right. And then there's the second concept you need to know, um, which is that, as already said, it's possible that you can run multiple content repository instances in your system. So that means a content repository cannot be a singleton object anymore because you, you might have multiple ones. So, what we have done is, you know, there's no problem in IT which cannot be solved with another level of indirection. <laughs> so that's what we did here. We created a content repository registry, and this one is a singleton. And through this registry, you can fetch the single content repository instance, like default or assets, for instance. And in this content repository instance, you can have access to all the projections, you have access to the node type management, to the content dimension config, and to the event store. And actually, I've been, um, uh, in, in the keynote, I've explained that we can run multiple dimensions depending on each uh, content repository, right? So we can have the one just in English, the other one in French, and in, in German, or even any other language dimension or some, some other dimension config. But actually, it will also enable us in the longer run to have different node types per content repository. And this is all prepared already. The only thing missing right now is that every node type manager just loads the, the, the nodes from the standard configuration nodes folder we just have right now. So it's all set up that we can also run true multi-site installations with different uh, node configurations, different node type configurations. There's just the only thing we need to figure out is how do we actually define that in, your con in the configuration file. Right. So enough of these concepts. Let's just look at some really specific diffs, what's going on. What has Rector actually changed? And 
one thing what this thing does is node interface has been moved and has been changed. So it's not just node interface anymore. It was, I think, content repository, domain, model, node interface. Now it's content repository core, projection, content graph, node. And what Rector does, it replaces this all over the place, but not just via a string replace, but via a really syntactic understanding of your code. So this is basically what, you do, what happens when you do PHP Storm Refactorer. This is the same idea and the same logic. And if you look really closely, it's not node interface anymore, but it's node. So that means the node object is final. And it's a class you cannot extend because you don't have to. There are other ways to hook into that. And this is one part which makes the API really, really stable. Right, so this is what has changed. This is basically a pure renaming. That's pretty easy, I would say. The second um, change we just want to look at is node traversal. So we are at a node, and we want to reach the parent node. That's the first example at the top. And actually, with node traversal, we, we, we very much held on to the idea for a long time that the node must be able to access the parent, the children, all these things. But we had a lot of problems by coupling the node and the traversal together. So at some point, I think like one and a half, two years ago, we figured out that we, can, we should actually split that apart. That means um, you, um, you cannot just traverse from the node to its parent. But what you need to do is, first, you need to get the subgraph for the node. So remember, that was the thing just in English in the live workspace. And then you can ask the subgraph for finding the parent node. Right, so that's what you do, and then you, you don't pass in the full node, but you just pass in the ID of the node. So that means if you have the ID, you can directly fetch the parent. And for children, it works the same way, so get child nodes is the same thing. We fetch the subgraph, and then we have uh, this iterator to array, subgraph, find child nodes, node aggregate ID, find child nodes, filter all as node. It looks a bit more long for now, but that's the way it is. And there's one thing which is important here, which I, I would like to highlight, is this to do. So Rector, and the way we, we work with that, is that it also it, 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 it adds work to you. It, it basically gives you a to-do list, what you should think about when migrating this code. So please search for to do 9.0 migration. All the comments inserted by Rector are marked with this prefix. And so, for instance, this iterator to array call is not really needed in this case. Um, you, we could just get rid of that in this particular instance, but that's like our to-do list we can do to clean up our code. And these to-dos, we try to phrase them in a very good way, um, and, and we try to um, yeah, add, add to them one by one. Right. As already said, that's basically what Rector can do right out of the box. But I said it. We extended it in a bit, and one part what was really important for us was a way to change Fusion code. Because, uh, let's face it, what our integrators are doing is mostly Fusion code, and that's fine. That's one of the main power, powers of NEOS. And one thing you need to change is, for instance, you cannot just use a node as the entry identifier of a cache, um, cache entry identifier anymore. But you need to use this eel helper for that, saying, OK, Neos caching, entry identifier for node, blah, 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 blah. And this is also auto-migrated um, from, from before and after. And there's no node context anymore. So node context was one of the biggest problem makers in the 8-something version. So because it was just an object where everything was lumped together, basically, so we, we tried very hard to replace that with really explicit concepts. And the main idea is actually, Instead of asking the context attached to the node to some, for something, we rather have an eel helper which does the same functionality. So that means node context in backend is the same like Neos node in backend node. This is just the same thing, just written a bit differently. And um, then we have some renamings as well, like node.identifier doesn't exist anymore, but now the identifier is correctly spelled the node aggregate ID. And because we use value objects all over the place, we just have to add some dot value for some cases. Um, one, one last example uh, for Fusion code is actually um, it, it tries to fit, all, it, it tries to find all places where this migration is done, but in, as Fusion is not, fu not fully type safe, we cannot find all the places. So that means 
um, for instance, it just renames a certain variable names, but it doesn't replace uh, an, a variable called, I don't know, uh, starting point is here the example. So you see it's saying this dot starting point def, and it's not sure, is starting point actually a node? Probably, but it doesn't know. So that's why it doesn't auto-migrate it in this case, but it adds to do at the top of the file saying, well, you need to rename that to this and that, and we couldn't auto-migrate auto that because we were not sure if that is the case. So that is like the kind of issues you will have to manually change after running. Right, and there's one thing which is really important, which is a thing which is not listed on the slide. So uh, how would you do node traversal and fusion, right? You would do a flow query. You would do q node dot parents, q node children, and these kind of things, right? And it's not in here because this has not changed. So you can still use flow query just as before. It will internally use this, what we have just seen, but flow query has the same API as before, and this actually helps us to keep the stability for many, many parts of the system. So we have to change some parts, what I've seen here, what I've shown here, but actually, like, this traversal from, from, um, from, from um, the fusion side with parent and children and so on, this is actually being catered for um, without any changes. And by the way, there's even a flow query operation context and um, which is like, which exists in the old world and which still exists in the new one. It's marked as deprecated and, you know, just existing for backwards compatible reasons. But we really try hard to do the right thing in this case as well. Right. So we've seen fusion. And now I have to, I would like to show another example of what has changed configuration-wise. So we have PHP covered, we have fusion covered. What else do we need? Well, we need some YAML configuration changes. And um, that was actually a part I, I, I developed by procrastinating creating the slides because I wanted to, well, we, well, let's just quickly. What we need to do is we need to change the dimension configuration from the old to the new version. So it changes the place where it's located in the YAML tree. It also changes a bit like how you write it in the detail. And I. This was actually had to be done manually until like a week ago or something like that. But um, it, uh, as I said, I procrastinated creating the slides and explaining how you need to move things around. So I created the YAML migration. So that means you don't need to do anything of yourself. And what is actually been doing is we changed the content dimension configuration inside a certain content repository. So you see Neo's content repository registry, then the list of content repositories named default. So the default in there is the name of the content repository. And then you specify the dimensions for this specific content uh, repository. And the same thing is for the site configuration. So we tore apart, that was also a change in the last month, we, months, uh, we tore apart the content repository dimension configuration from the um, um, configuration of the routing. Because right now, this was all lumped together in one big pile, right? So you configured the URL path segment for the dimensions in there, and the ordering was important, and so on. And it was also a point which we needed to extend in our projects quite a lot. So we have completely redone that. And what you now need to do is you, you specify a site-specific configuration for resolving content dimensions for the URL, and then you also have to you basically specify how your content dimensions and your URL segments match together. And this is very extensible. You can also um, um, you can add your own parts to that. We learned a lot from real-world projects there where we need a lot of uh, uh, specialized uh, dimension configuration in there. So this is just, and, and this is again automatically migrated from the old version. So that's just an example like what, what, how this configuration looks, out, looks there. Okay. So, to sum it up, please don't fear the migration to Neon 9. We have automated tools to change your code base, and this includes PHP, but it also includes um, Fusion, and it includes um, configuration. And we also have automated tools to import your old content um, in, in a lot of ways. And please 
reach out to us in case of problems. We are there to help, and I'm sure that we together can, uh, can make NEOS 9, the upgrade to NEOS 9 even more flawless, because as more and more projects have been upgraded and as more and more packages are compatible with NEOS 9, the easier it will get for everybody. So if we work together as a community right now for this part, we can really make all our lives a lot easier. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I wanted to say I learned two things. One, you just mentioned in your summary that all of us can make our lives for upgrading to NEOS 9 much easier if you try it beforehand and then give Sebastian and the others the opportunity to fix those issues that are still appearing in all of your projects when the actual release of NEOS 9 happens. So that is your job in the coming half a year about to make sure that your upgrade path to NEOS 9 is as easy as possible. And the second thing I learned is, um, before the release of NEOS 9, we should probably have another opportunity for you to speak and procrastinate <laughs> 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 to fix all the issues, actually. So we have uh, some questions for you. Um, where do we start? Um, we start uh, with content. Mm -hmm. can, uh, can site exports from pre-NEOS 9 be imported in a new NEOS 9 instance to mm -hmm. facilitate upgrading? Yeah. So right now not. So we cannot migrate from site exports right now. So we have tried this path before, but it has numerous difficulties because a site export is sadly not enough to do a migration because a site export is lacking the configuration uh, like what dimensions exist and these kind of things and this is actually crucial for the migration to work so we we, we this was actually one of our plans to try that but uh, we we still figured out well you still need the right content dimension configuration and that was the difficulty so that that's why we decided to go the way to upgrade a working version and the working database what is actually working is what I've shown right now is upgrading from an, from an existing database. Um, you could also specify another database there. And um, um, so you could basically have an empty database and upgrade from another existing pre-filled database where the data is read from. This would also work. And uh, last but not least, we will never change your old data. So that means after the upgrade, the old node data table is still there, and the old data is still there um, in the way it was before. We never read from it anymore, but it's still there, so we don't destroy anything during the update. So um, at the start of your talk, you uh, showed um, some problems with existing packages, mm -hmm. and I actually have a comment I would turn uh, into a question for you. Um, you run Rector on all the packages from John, mm -hmm. so <laughs> how would you um, put those changes to GitHub? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the problem is if you normally run uh, uh, the Composer install, it will just copy the zip file so without any git and stuff around that. What is really important to run Composer install minus minus prefer source and this will check out, uh, this will make sure that you end up with a package so every package will then have a .git directory and will be its own Git repository. And this means if you then do a migration, you can then enter the package folder, and then you can just do a git diff, and you'll see the direct changes of, of this single package. And then you could just push it towards GitHub and create a pull request and so on. And the only reason I didn't do it yet for John's packages, as an example, is just because I wanted to demonstrate like this whole process. But of course, yeah, that the, would be the next step, definitely. Okay, and uh, I'm sorry, if, sorry for picking <laughs> John. It was just really the packages which existed there. It would have been the same with any other package. So, <laughs> so uh, what happens when an orphaned node is not migrated to the new content repository but is referenced by another node, e.g., by a content reference node? Will that reference be broken after migrating the data? That's a good question. I would need to test that. <laughs> <laughs> so you need uh, time to procrastinate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about that. We, we would need to try that. Um, by the way, the content repository has a really, really good test coverage. Um, the migration system, I'm not sure if we have some there because there's a lot of, like, the old system has lots of edge cases which we try to fix and work around when we read this data in. So it might be that we need, need to fix these kind of things when we, when we encounter them. Yeah. 
And is there already a working fork of Neo's demo with? Um, I think Neo's demo is actually working and pushed because that is the version we are using all the time. We have been using all the time for development for a long time. I personally try to avoid using Neo's demo anymore, like also for developing Neo's 9 because it's just a bit too simple for our needs. And for Neo's 9, actually, if you run Rector on it, uh, for Neo's demo, if you run Rector on it, I think you end up with one or two changes. So it's almost nothing what is, what's ending up there as modification just because the package is pretty clean and also pretty simple in, in terms of code base. And if you already noticed, uh, there will be a new Neos demo a refactored mm -hmm. that I can add. And um, there is actually a fork for this refactored uh, oh. version for awesome. yeah. Neos 9. When using Atomic Fusion prop types, mm -hmm. a migration of uh, the examples such as this dot starting point would be possible, wouldn't it? I guess. I mean, I think I think um, for prop types. So what we prop types are a way to type your, your or to add typings to your fusion code, and we would need to add a migration which uh, changes node interface to node in there as well. So I think that's what we need to do. We don't do it right now, but um, the migrations are pretty easy to write actually, and they are also fully test driven. So you, it's really easy. You basically write, "This is my old code. This is my new code," and then you have a really good test bed where you can work on the migrations. So as said, there are lots of examples in the Neos Rector package. So that's really something where we can collaborate really well together. And uh, someone of the audience wanted you to um, explain the node aggregate. Uh. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So um, the thing is, we, we had the problem that a node in the old system meant a lot of different things. So usually a node meant, okay, this is, I don't know, the home page in German in a certain workspace. This is the usual definition of our node, right? But sometimes in the old system, it also meant, well, it's the node in German and in English and in French of the homepage at the same time, so when building a dimension menu, for instance. So it was not really, really clear definitions for that. So we, um, we, we tried to, or we figured out really early on in the process that this is actually two different things. So the one is basically the sum of all the nodes across all the dimensions, that's the node aggregate. And the individual parts are the nodes. And um, so, as, as an idea, if you are just in a single, in a single dimension, um, so we are just in English, for instance, then you just traverse nodes up and back, and that's what you usually do. But if you want to cross the dimensions and you want to go from German to English, then you usually need the node aggregate because it allows you to travel horizontally from one node to the other, for instance, to render a dimension menu. And adding to that uh, is a question, what if we have extended the node class? Yeah. So, um, you will, you will see that actually you, you have probably extended a node class for two reasons. Either you wanted to load some properties in there, that's one typical reason, and the other one is you would want to modify the way the traversal works. For the first, so, so for going from parent to children and so on. So for the first scenario, when you, for, the, for, the, for, for changing properties, um, what you can do is you can uh, create or you can modify the way how an arbitrary object is, is, is serialized into the node and back out again. So we call that property serializers, and these are just symphony serializer objects. So that means you cannot modify the node in itself, but you can very easily add or, or change the way, um, for instance, how a certain object type should be put and stored into a node. And when reloading it back, we can connect it to other objects or whatever you want to do there. That's for the one use case. And the other use case for changing, for changing the traversal logic, actually, you could override flow query operations. Or we would be very interested in your specific use cases because actually we, it might be that you know, we've, we've overlooked something, but we've really challenged what we have right now with many, many big projects as well. And I've just recently also tried this migration on a really big project of us. Um, and uh, so I would be really curious about uh, your experiences or also your, your things which might be missing. Yeah. So I think this leads us to the last question. Um, how could I contribute to NEOS 9? Mm -hmm. You mentioned some possibilities, but to wrap it up. Yeah. So to wrap it up, first thing is I think to uh, so you can contribute by using Neos 9 and upgrading your packages because this is where we really need co community effort. And if you are unsure how you can approach that for a certain kind of package which you have developed, then just talk to us and we can just give you some hints into the right directions. 
Um, second thing is um, you can help us by trying to upgrade your projects and then seeing what things go wrong and what things break. And then we can create new rector migrations. So basically going from the old version to the new version. And uh, this is actually can be done really test driven in a pretty good way. And, um, and last but not least, of course, we can also contribute by, by fixing some, some bugs in the core system, which we sadly sometimes have. Not so many, but some. No, but we have topics we are working on. There is a big GitLab, GitHub board. Um, um, and uh, for instance, Danny Lubitz has contributed a lot in the recent, uh, um, in the recent um, uh, weeks and months and did a lot of changes there. And um, he, for instance, fixed the asset usage in the Neos backend, uh, which really helped us a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for this talk about how to migrate a project to Neos 9. Thank you very much. Thanks.